to become the member of the ethnic minority recruiting team and volunteered where his role was to promote, engage and assist with recruiting more minorities into the service. He awarded an MBE in 2005 with the Queen's Birthday Honours and promoted to flight sergeant. He was posted to RF Honington as the Force Protection Force HQ supply manager, making sure of their supplies for training and engagement on Operation Herrick and Telic, amongst others. He was awarded a Meritorious Service Medal in the New Year's Honours li list in 2008. He retired from regular service in July 2014, and uh, he was re-enlisted as a full-time Reserve Service Warrant Officer, which is where we see you now, I understand. Uh, thank you for joining us, Warrant Officer uh, Balbir Singh Flora. Thank you very much and uh, uh, for invi inviting me and giving me the opportunity. Yes, and uh, thank you. Um, our next guest is Professor Augustine August John, born in Grenada and lived mainly in the UK since 1964. He was a member of the Campaign Against Racial Discrimination in the middle to late 1960s and a member of the Council of Institute of Race Relations in the 1970s. He is a, described as a scholar activist who has done notable work in several fields, including education policy, the role of schooling and education promoting social justice, school improvement, management and international development. Since the 1960s, he's been active in the issues of education and schooling in Britain's inner cities, getting involved at government department level. He has been community education head of the Inner London Education Authority and in 1989 became the first African director of the education in Britain, a post he held for just under eight years. In 1997, he was appointed advisor to former British Home Secretary Jack Straw on race and social inclusion, and in that capacity, worked with civil servants on the Race Relations Act in 2000. In 1999, uh, Professor John co-founded the Communities Empowerment Network, CEN, a charitable organization providing advocacy and representation for excluded school children and their parents and carers. He is now the patron and interim chair of the CEN. Professor John has also worked in a number of university settings, including as visiting professor of education at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow for about 10 years, and also associate professor of education and honorary fellow of the London Centre for Leadership and Learning at the UCL Institute of Education. Since 2016, he's also visiting professor at Coventry University, where he's working with the vice chancellor and university leadership team, improving strategic management of the university and building a culture of equity. Since 2018, Professor John has delivered many public lectures on the relevance of Black History Month to higher education and the growing movement to decolonize the curriculum and decolonize higher education. A respected public speaker and media commentator, Professor John works internationally as an executive coach and a management and social investment consultant. He has been named as one of the 30 most influential African diaspora leaders in the world and is listed as one of the 100 great Black Britons. Thank you and welcome, Professor John. Thank you so much. <laughs> and final guest, Carissa Khan, President-elect of the Royal Aero Society um, this coming year, 2022 to 23. So she is an aeronautical engineer and technical expert in complex and integrated aerospace systems. She's a recognized thought leader in sustainable future aviation and currently leads innovation for 300 million pounds worth of future flight challenge at the UK Research and Innovation. She is a member of the UK Trade Organization for Aerospace, Defense, Security and Space as part of the Advanced Air Mobility Group. This year, in, 22, in 2022, she was um, recognized by the organization eVTOL Insights, which is a leading source of information in global markets for urban air mobility and electric vertical takeoff and landing eVTOL aircraft. They recognize Carissa in their 2022 Power Book as one of the most influential people in the eVTOL industry for her leadership in future air mobility markets. Her pre previous roles include research, design and development of world's class aerospace systems for a wide range of military, commercial and business aircrafts. And Chris is also a founding signatory of the Women in Aviation and Aerospace Charter and the Women in Defense Charter. In 2016, she became the youngest Royal Aero Society Council member the first woman to chair the Gloucester and Cheltenham branch, which is established since 1930, and the youngest member of the Royal Aero Society Learned Society Board. And she co-created the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, of which I am very proud to be a member of. 
Her portrait is exhibited at the Wilson Art Gallery and Museum in recognition for her achievements as a recognized engineering hero, inspirational woman in STEM and industry trailblazer empowering future generations. Um, as said, she's also president-elect uh, of the Royal Aero Society for 22-23. I'm proud to have you here, Carissa. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Okay, thank you. So um, that's the introductions for everybody watching. Now, thank you for joining us today. And um, what we'd like to do is to have a discussion generally about um, the overall terminology around uh, Black, Asian, minority, ethnic uh, people in um, and industry in STEM and uh, generally and also in the society of uh, Royal Errol. Um, I'd like to sort of open with asking, so why do we need this terminology? So I'm going to use uh, the term BAME or BAME as this catch-all, so Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic, uh, as this acceptable word that is in use today. Um, and I'm going to ask, well, why, why do we need this word at all. Now, we know that um, we have a report from the Henley Business School called the Equity Effect, saying that when giving a survey to a lot of companies, business leaders and uh, employees in different, uh, different minorities and ethnicities, um, and they were asked about what is stopping racial equity in workplaces. And they responded with a variety of statements. But of those statements, we pick some answers, that 27% of white business leaders fear that they will use the wrong or insensitive terminology when addressing racial issues, whilst 21% of BAME leaders thought the same. So this is one indicator that, OK, the people are disturbed by they don't know what to say, perhaps, and also 34% of BAME employees are concerned about the lack of empathy from colleagues about discrimination. Whereas white employees were asked, about 23% of them thought that empathy was uh, a contributor to these sorts of things. So for me, this sort of suggests that people might want to do something, but they have no, uh, they have a fear and have no idea where to start for the case of if they say anything, they might offend somebody and cause even more concerns. So how do we proceed? So um, how, do, how do the forces proceed? So um, uh, Warrant Officer Flora, ba Bali, please. Uh, how do the forces deal with uh, ethnicity and how do you refer to them? I mean, we were referred to as um, BAME, B -A -M -E, mm -hmm. until about two, three weeks ago. And obviously, because there's been a lot of uh, stuff in the media about people sort of saying, you know, we're not happy with the term and stuff like that. Um, so we've now had direction to say we're now to be referred to as EM ethnic minorities in general. Um, but uh, as we, we were discussing yesterday, while well, we had a quick trial test run to make sure all the link communication links work and everything else. You know, I remember I remember when I was in the, the recruiting job, you know, we were known as ethnic minorities back in 1999 mm. onwards, you know, and then just as I was leaving that job, um, that wasn't popular anymore. And they were looking at us calling us visible minorities and stuff like that. And then people were saying, well, what about the non-visible minority groups, you know, things like that. Mm. I, and I, th I think, you know, we're getting too, I think we get too hung up with the terminology and we need a title or whatever. I mean, in my opinion, you know, we need that title because we need to collect the data and the st uh, and the stats to sort of say, you know, minority groups are being underrepresented in, in like public organisations, for example, in the military, and that and by using that terminology, regardless of what it is, we can collect the data to say there are not enough uh, people from the, the um, Black Asian minority groups, uh, etc., and then by then breaking that data down further, we can also then say, right, you know, again, in the military, you know, we have quite a few um, females, women joining, you know, but not as many are going into engineering. So it's addressing that side as well to encourage, uh, you know, the STEM subjects and some stuff like that. I mean, we've got uh, roles in the Air Force that tradition and even the other two services that traditionally have been very sort of good at having that diversity you know, with the gender side of things, you know, but there are other jobs which are totally the opposite end, end of the scale. So if you look at sort of administration, the catering roles, RF police, they all tend to do well with the, the gender side, but not on the BAME side. You know, so it's that kind of thing. How do you address that? Uh, and it's only like I said, you know, by having that terminology to say, yep, yeah, no, until recently BAME, um, 
you know, you can collect the data and sort of figure and then try and figure out why and how can we target and diversify the rest of the Air Force and the other roles that we have, you know, and I know the Navy are doing exactly the same, the Army are doing the same, and we're also even looking at the civil service within defense, you know, how can they be more diverse as well? So it's all that kind of thing, you know, you need a title and you know, how long does that title go around, you know, because somebody will object and then we'll have to say, hang on, okay, we need to change it, we'll change it. You now, does it really matter what the title is? as long as we have a title to collect that data so we can then address the um, issues by maybe certain groups or the underrepresentation by other groups, you know, and we need to collect that data. And mm. for that, you need some sort of a title. Okay. Um, uh, Professor John Gus, uh, I'm aware that you've given lectures on this sort of topic and uh, I noticed you were interested when we were talking when I said let's use BAME it's uh, please give us a <laughs> give us your opinion well first to say that um, as, as as Bali said um, BAME has become more and more unacceptable mm -hmm. to vast numbers of people and I think rightly so um, uh, let, let me let me headline what I'm going to say by, by observing this the main problem with these acronyms or uh, whatever you want to call them is that they they minoritize people yeah mm. um is is the minoritizing that 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 is very problematic because you see i have been in this business since the middle 1960s as you've observed in your in your introduction i have never known the white population of britain to be called the ethnic majority. Right. And when even politicians speak, they speak as if there is no ethnicity involved in Britain. It, 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 it is white, white is normal, white is normative, and, and it's what people, people expect. And therefore, anything else becomes the other. Now, that, that is the fundamental problem because in a situation where, for example, in the 1970s, we were having massive campaigns against eugenicists like uh, um, Charles Cyril, Cyril, Sir Cyril Burt and Francis Galton and Carl Spearman and people from UCL talking about uh, the, the, the attributing the, the poor performance of black children in schools, let's say, to the fact that uh, they are racially inferior in intelligence, all right? Now, these, these, these are not incidental things. They, they go to the heart of the matter in terms of how people from the global south are seen as a collective um, and, and the way in which a, a knowledge, well, Britain and, and the United States is seen as, if you like, the epicenter of knowledge production. Now, that minoritizing has various consequences. Uh, you, you mentioned the decolonizing uh, um, um, issue. The consequences are that people are not seen as making the same contribution to the evolution of, of human knowledge as white Europeans, let's say. And if you were to look at it simply from the from the from the point of view of of um, numbers, uh, minority majority whatever, mm. the fact of the matter is when you consider the, the 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 populations that these black Asian minority ethnic people constitute globally, it's it's farcical to, to suggest that we are some kind of an ethnic minority. We might be, we might be a portion, a small proportion of the overall English population, but that doesn't make us a minority. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it is that minoritizing, language has an enormous amount of power. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and it, 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 it builds things up in people's heads. They develop mindsets about that. And, and so more recently, in, well, certainly from about the year, 2000, in my writings and my lectures, I started talking about the global majority for that very reason. 
Mm. When you consider the, uh, the, the, the population of, 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 of Africa, of uh, the Indian subcontinent, of <laughs> Southeast Asia, China, yeah. China uh, I mean, and, and so we come, we come to Britain, even me from <laughs> small, that pebble in, in, the, in the Caribbean Sea called Grenada, 135 square miles, you know, I could run, I could run around it 10 times in a day. If you, in spite of the fact that I come from that very small place, mm. I, have a, I have a global consciousness. I don't see myself as being limited in my thinking and in my worldview, simply by the fact that uh, I am on a piece of rock, which is only 135 square miles uh, mm. in, in, the, in, in, in diameter or whatever it is. So, mm. so it, it's, it's really a question of understanding that and understanding it in the context of Britain as a former colonial territory, former colonial power. Yeah, it, it, it was the hmm. empire. Yeah. So in the, in the sense that it was punching above its weight for its size, given its Britain's size compared to the rest of the world, and then that it was holding power over much larger, numerically larger nations. Is well, that what you're saying? Time. So at that's the true. time, it was powerful. Well, well, indeed, absolutely. I mean, you know, when I was growing up and doing geography at school, and I looked at the, 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 the huge map of the world that was on the head teacher's uh, um, um, wall, Two thirds of it was pink, you know, and <laughs> pink meant this is where the, the 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 empire was. So, so I mean, these these things are quite important in terms of how we see ourselves and how we are defined by others. And I do not believe that that minoritizing has done any good to mm -hmm. advancing uh, race relations or the human rights of non-white people in this society. Okay. Um, before I uh, ask the next question, which is going to be, well, okay, great, no bane, then what else? But I, I want to ask the industry point of view from Carissa in that case. Well, from, from your experience in many different forms of industry in aerospace and now government levels of aerospace, uh, what, uh, how do you perceive it? So how do you, how does the, the, the circles that you keep in industry uh, deal with the, the kind of the black Asian minority population? How do you welcome them in? How do you classify them, if any? Well, I think, first of all, I'm having almost like an emotional response to what you just said, Professor Gus. Um, I'm from a, a slightly bigger pebble right next to you <laughs> born in Trinidad and Tobago, so we're neighbours. Um, <laughs> and the first time I've been referred to as a minority was when I came to the UK. So, I mean, I would not be a minority in the Caribbean, I'm a majority. So it's really interesting what you say about the power of language uh, as well. Um, I think, so I'll answer your question, Shivit, maybe from a more personal level. Um, so I think when I was trying to understand the term BAME, I was looking at, well, where did this come from? And I understand, so this is before my time, I confess, in the 70s, um, the, the BME was used and it was, you know, part of the, the anti-racist movement who identified as politically black and, you know, different ethnic groups banded together under an umbrella term to fight against discrimination. So you understand where a strong collective voice was needed then. And you can understand how, you know, that collective term serves that ethos stronger together. We have shared experiences. We, we as a group, want to be treated equally um, with equal rights as members of the white community. I think it's important to acknowledge that, um, uh, you know, um, members of the whatever umbrella term we want to use or whatever term we want to use face ethnic penalties, whether that is direct, indirect, systemic discrimination or marginalization we we face ethnic penalties so you want to you want to acknowledge that you want to give some ground to start talking about the differential treatment that those with this status whether you want to call it minority or whatever you want to call it face so here you can see some reasonable ground for a term being put in place but we have evolved and um, we must acknowledge that you know, it's it's a complex term. 
and their positive and negative perceptions and connotations around that terminology that we cannot ignore that Professor Gus has just highlighted being called a minority. What does that actually mean? I think um, we're moving past fighting just for equality. We're fighting for equity. And so on a deeper level, we need to just drill down and think about ethnicity perhaps on a more granular level so that we can assess the concerns associated with different ethnicities within this collective. Um, and I think if organizations, if in aerospace, aviation space, etc., um, want to tackle certain um, barriers to progression, then whether that's within the workforce, access to skills, education, etc., we need to look at the disparities that are associated with certain ethnicities across um ac across that group so you see you see the 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 need for some terms so that we can start that conversation but is it is it the right term because we're trying to put ethnicity in and describe it in a binary way you're either white hmm. sure. or you're something other. else <laughs> yeah. and we're the other to... box is a nice way of putting the other <laughs> term right mm -hmm. and i've ticked mm -hmm. other so many times on forms that i've filled out but um, we're trying to find a politically correct way of saying non-white. At the end of the day, there's stigma attached to that group, the other group. Some negative connotations attached to that group. And even if we change the vocabulary, we need to be careful that stigma isn't carried across. Can we avoid that? I don't know. I don't know. Any term will take one new connotation. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I, re Mali I resonate. Yeah, I resonate with that one, you know, because purely because there is no tick box for Sikhs. <laughs> mm, you know, uh, I, I can be an, a generic Indian, but I'm not because I was born in Kenya in Africa. So, you know, we tick boxes, we tick other and then put down that we're Punjabi because because I'm from the Punjab. Well, my family originated from the Punjab region, you know, and mm. then we asked for a separate tick box for us because the UN recognizes us as a, a different community group you know as Sikhs as a race yet in the census we're not mentioned anywhere you know so how then can you collate the data to say we've got this many Sikhs so this year you know on social media is so powerful that the last census a thing went out to say everybody do not tick Indian or whatever but mm -hmm. tick, as in country of origin yeah India but on the other bits for religion etc tick other and make sure you write seeking you know that kind of thing okay force them to recognize what the other is yeah, and say exactly that, okay. yeah it because was like we are... were saying some religious affiliation at one point we'll say yeah. okay right jedi i mean it's a bit more <laughs> yeah a bit more so, comedy but the idea was there mm, so, yeah. so it'll be interesting to see you know when the results are published to see if that's been reflected correctly or not you know uh but it but it's that it's that kind of thing you know so sometimes you have to force um the powers of be, you know, the government and stuff like that, because they actually, mm. the community went to them and said, look, we want to be actually reflected properly. And, you know, they were told, no, sorry, you know, you're covered in this element. And, and then as Sikhs, you, you're not necessarily from the Indian subcontinent. I know many Sikhs, mm. you know, who are from, uh, who are white and they're American. I mean, just last Thursday, Friday, I was with a Sikh who is actually a German born German you know, born in Hamburg and then migrated to uh, America, speaks with an American accent, but he practices Sikhism as a faith, you know. So you can't just lump us all as being Indian. And as I said, I was born in Africa, third generation in, in Africa, because my grandfather had moved there. Uh, and then I've come to Britain now. So I sort of identify with being, because people say, oh, you're Indian. I normally tend to say, no, I'm actually, I'm African because I was born in Africa. But mm -hmm. my heritage is Indian. You know, and that kind of thing. So, as you know, as you said, Gus, you know, we are the majority and, and, and maybe we need to start looking at sort of saying, actually, you know what? We're one human race. We just different backgrounds and different uh, uh, things. So so I know we look we've got, you know, since we sort of spoke a few days ago, we, we've actually had uh, uh, a meeting come up. So the RAF BAME network is going to meet and we're going to discuss what we're going to call ourselves. So the army have already yeah, jumped right. the gun and they're now the multicultural uh group you know so we're going to discuss you know what terminology we're going to use and hopefully we'll come to a sort of one amicable decision that's 
pretty generic, covers everybody. Because, again, to be part of the network, you don't have to be a person of color. You know, you can be anybody as long, you know, even if you affiliate, affiliate yourself and you understand what we need, because we need the allies as well, you know, who are on our side. So if they want to join as well, you know, they need to have an input into it as well. And so let's you know, say what they feel. Prefer, so, Gus, please, um, have you, I mean, in from what I'm hearing, that there, there is, let's say, there's some benefit or some case to have some kind of terminology um, to refer to the people we're trying to attract. As if you have, if you look in the Aero Society as a whole, if you look in an engineering organization or a military organization, you're probably going to find that the, the minorities are the either minority people like ourselves are the, the fewer number of, yeah, the, yeah, of the people yeah. so how do we refer to these people in a, in a let's say constructive manner i recognize that generally speaking one, one shouldn't go around saying you foreigner you're different i'm different you're not white that's not helpful but in the context of the aero society or the in context of an organization that's trying to bring in more uh, black asian minority people how would you recommend that they proceed well look, the, the, the 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 major problem is this Black is not a country, right? Hmm. Isn't it isn't a continent? Asia is a continent and, and a region of the world. Black isn't that, nor is is minority ethnic that. Minority ethnic would mean all kinds of things. Do you know what hmm. I mean? And it's it's one way of really displacing people and their actual identity. I, I refer to myself as African. I yes. never refer to myself as Grenadian unless I want to be very specific about, you know, the place of my birth or whatever. But I'm African. Um, and and I have always struggled with the, 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 this notion of, of black because it doesn't really tell me anything um, any, more than, any more than talking about a multicultural does. Because mm. culture, culture is, not, is not tied or fixed to ethnicity. There was multiculturalism, God knows, in Britain long before the likes of you and me started coming here. Um, and, and on the axis of class, on the axis of, of, of sexuality, all sorts of things. So those, those are clumsy terms. Mm. And, and BAME is a particularly clumsy term, and I'm, I find it increasingly offensive, actually. Um, so, 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 for another reason too. So, all my children, six of them, were born in this country. They now have children of their own. Their children are still being referred to and seen in the same way that their grandparents were, who came here in the, in the 1950s. In other words, there's no differentiation between black people who have become we we. I, as a parent, have made Britain the home of my children. Mm. Some of them have not yet been to the Caribbean. They identify with Britain, bots and all. Yeah. So the question is, how for how many generations would we continue with this nonsense of mm. <laughs> ethnic minority and BAME and God knows what else? It it just it just does not work. Um, I, I had I had uh, my granddaughter come home a couple of weeks ago, well, more than a couple of weeks ago, complaining about a boy in her class, a little white boy of her age, calling her a nigger and telling the whole class to call her that. Now, hmm. there are two children, age 10, one white, one black, both born in this country. And that's the kind of conflict that arises between them. So yeah. when will she feel that she does not have to be the subject of that kind of mm. racial slur and and, uh, and, 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 and and what have you? And to a large extent, we, you know, we're talking about these matters as if they're, in a sense, decontextualized. The context of it is the refusal of this country, great as it is, to confront the legacy of empire. The fact that Britain found itself all over the world without anybody say so, it just went with all its might and power and the Bible. The fact that it did that um, uh, uh, has to have some 
consequences in terms of how British people see themselves. When I first came here, there was still a lot of jingoism about rule Britannia and land of hope and glory and all that kind of stuff. And I was, rem I was reminded by, by my school friends only in, on a Zoom um, um, recently <laughs> that at Presentation College in Grenada, every 24th of May, we and every other school in the country would go to the main savannah, to the square, there to celebrate Empire Day and sing all of these jingoistic empire songs and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I find that hugely offensive. And that's the context of, of, of all the stuff about Kate and William going to the Caribbean and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. The point I'm making therefore is this. If the country had set about acknowledging that racism was a direct byproduct of imperialism and colonialism, acknowledging that white people form the view of themselves, of the country, of their identity, based upon those exploits and, and, and what have you, which justified the enslavement of my ancestors on the grounds that we were only three-fifth human or whatever it was. If, if, if it had acknowledged that and started off at least after 1945 by saying, there has to be a role for schooling and education in counteracting that racism, in giving white people a better understanding of their own history and of what imperialism meant, then by now we would have made much more progress. Rather than that, the, the, the racist trope was there. We were seen as totally other. And, and let's remember, although we're talking about the Commonwealth and, and, and all of that stuff, the fact of the matter is, as I know from when I was a director of education, the immigration, the border agency in this country has a totally, totally different approach to the white commonwealth, New Zealand and Australia, than it does, than it does to people from the Caribbean and from, from, from Africa. And, and race, colorism, pigmentation is a massive part of that. So what I'm saying is that to a large extent is the way in which the government has structured itself and continues with its policies that make all of these things so convoluted and difficult and, and, and cr creates confusion for young black children born in Britain with as much right to determine the future of this society as anybody else. Very impassioned and, and clear arguments, Gus. I think um, what I understand is that where you're going with that is the whole point of these terminologies and things, certainly in the UK and possibly, I don't know about the rest of Europe, but many, we know that many other countries around the world also had imperialist views like the Dutch East India Company and so forth mm -hmm. in the past. Now, okay, but in terms of the UK and what, what we're looking there, but uh, to have these terms in itself is essentially perpetuating um, that level of, let's say, segregation or pigeonholing com entire communities as those mm. people over there, you're just being nice about it or changing the word, but you're still those people over there. So in, in terms of what concrete things can we do as to say to the, what would you say to the Royal Aero Society, for example, to say that what, what are you going to do? Stop using BAME, perhaps, okay, fine, but what would you say is start really trying to get to the bottom of which is where Bali actually started with talking about getting data on who is your demographic and then look, trying to really identify groups as individual groups and then calling them the you know the multiculturalism of the society I mean what, what would you recommend um, because I'm, I'm trying to take what you've, what you've opened to the discussion on the broad aspect of that but yeah. I'm, I'm thinking yes it's absolutely I, valid and what do I do with that bringing that back to the Royal Aero Society with, for whom we're having this debate today. Sure, 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 sure. I spend a lot of time, uh, as you can imagine, um, assisting organizations, not just education ones, with strategies for dealing with precisely that, yes? Mm. And, and I, I always begin by saying to people, if you change the focus from the, those who are excluded, for want of a better word, marginalized, underrepresented, to yourself and ask the question, what is it about us that prevent people 
routinely, organically, thinking they can be a part of this organization, applying to be part of it, and knowing that when they apply, their applications would be treated in the same equitable manner as anybody else. So, so turning the focus on oneself as an organization and asking what are the barriers to, to, to better representation? What images are we putting out about ourselves? Why is it that we can't, in the general run of things, care careers, fairs, um, um, uh, articulate the arrangements with schools and colleges and so on and so forth? What, 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 what is it that we need to change? Because the problem isn't always with the individual BAME people. Sure. Um, it, 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 is, it is therefore a matter of scrutinizing oneself. And, and in that connection, let me just quickly add one thing. The, we, the term, okay, we started off with equal opportunities. Then it was equal opportunities and diversity and gradually um, um, inclusion was, was, was in, 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 in included in, 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 in all of that, yeah? But then again, inclusion is not is not generally scrutinized in a manner that makes it useful for the organization. Because if you if you're going to include people and bring in those who who previously were excluded, mm. you've got to take you've got to allow for the fact that you're giving them permission because they had been excluded and because on coming in. They might actually find things that 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 give them evidence of why there is exclusion. You have to allow for the fact that you're giving them permission to 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 interpret the organization to itself through the prism of their experience of it, and assist it thereby to make the adjustments, etc., that are necessary. That's a very interesting point. So one of the things we did ask ourselves as part of the diversity and inclusion working group, as we were before, is that, you know, it's all very well bringing minorities and people in to be, let's say, members of the society. But then once they get there, if they find that there are people who have racist views or prejudicial views and they just realize, that, hang on, I don't want to be here in the first place, why so didn't apply? Because I thought it was racist or it's filled with people who have uh, unwelcoming views. And now I've been proven right because it's filled with unwelcoming people. So then you leave. So there's no point in saying, hey, well done. We've elected 200 new members or something and then find that they all leave because we haven't changed ourselves any Precisely. from what we were 150 Precisely. years ago. So I Precisely. think that's a very OK. I, I, th I understand where you're going with that. So that instead of focusing too much on terminology, focus on what the organization itself is really breaking down for ourselves and looking at ourselves and saying, this is what we do. And this could apply to any company, actually. This is in any organization and say, well, what do we do really typically? What is the process from someone picking up again? How do we filter? those applications how do we choose is there an algorithm that is inherently programmed by people to do what the people want and if you know somebody said to me that if you have an ai programmed by a racist it's going to be a racist ai because it's it simply it is tr you're training yes, something sure, 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 sure. okay so that's i think that's a very concrete thing to do um uh, so Bali. Uh, oh, sorry, Carissa. Yeah. Oh, Shuma, just a comment on that. So I guess it's right. understanding how can we as an organization foster that sense of belonging, regardless of, of ethnicity. I think, you know, one of the um, concerns that people have um, about the, this umbrella term is it shouldn't be used by organizations as a tick box, as you're saying, Shuma, yes, mm. let's recruit so many BAME members, etc. If we don't re really focus on the areas that may be misrepresented or underrepresented, I think that's something that we would need to be careful of. It's not we've recruited so many BAME members, therefore done, achieved, then that really hasn't achieved anything. We haven't really created or fostered a sense of belonging for different members of, of our communities, of different ethnicities. So that's something that we need to look at. I mean, definitely. Uh, yes. no, yeah. I mean, the military, you know, trying to promote that there are opportunities out there to the various different diverse communities that we have in the country, you know, and and the gender spectrum as well. Um, 
what we try and promote is that there are opportunities there and please do have a look at them because there might be something that you might have never even thought of. And that's the way we sort of try and tackle people to come to us. And then obviously, um, you know, we, we take a lot of role models with us when we go and do sort of big events. So, for example, on the 1st of June, I've got uh, the Reach Society in London doing mm -hmm. an event at Leicester University. And I'll be there as an Asian, one of my colleagues who's the the majority group, you know, as we mentioned him earlier on, you know, he's white, uh, he's going to be there. But then I'm going to have reflective role models there for the youngsters to speak to, because I think that's important. And make sure there's a couple of girls there. One, I mean, one of them's in the RF police, the other one's an engineer and that kind of thing. Because when the youngsters come in, they need to see somebody like them Sure. who are in the organization and then talk to them you know and, and then you that's where you get the questions you know what's it really like you know how have you found it did you have any problems that kind of issue you know um and then hopefully these youngsters will go away and think about it and eventually if they want to decide on a career to join the air force or the army or the navy uh you know and and that's the thing you know you need to let them know break those stereotypical job sort of things down you know, their, and their aspirations and let them know of all the opportunities that are available so they can make their own informed um, decisions. I mean, with my role, when I first did the old job, you know, when I was part of the Ethnic Minorities Recruitment Team back in 1999, so when they reformed the team uh, about five years ago, one of the first things we said is, look, we don't want anything like that. So we, we were initially called the spe Specialist Engagement Team because we weren't just recruiters, we were out there engaging with the communities and making them aware of the opportunities. So, so they've now changed their title to community engagement. Uh, and we're looking at actually changing that as well to just to go to career careers engagement or careers awareness team, you know, mm -hmm. because we're more about letting people know what the opportunities are. And then if they do join, how do we cater for them? So for example, this somebody's, is yeah. yeah, you know, so somebody is a Sikh, you know, who's uh, wants to join the air force, yeah, OK, you can join. But then how do you cope with your term and the beard, the five K's and stuff like that? You know, we've got Muslim girl who wears a hijab, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, because that's not wasn't normally covered in the dress regulations because we have a uniform code, you know, so we changed the uniform code and evolved it to include the hijab and how it's going to be worn and stuff like that. You know, so all of these things need to be consideration uh, taken into consideration, you know, and, and I was lucky because I'm sort of quite passionate about this. So when, when I did my degree in logistics management, my dissertation was actually about the logistical implications of recruiting somebody from an ethnic, ethnic minority group. And I looked at the subject and it's so vast, you know, because each faith has got their own niche requirements and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. then I narrowed it down to a, a case of a Sikh turban. And I managed to get 15,000 words. And even then I had too many and I had to sort of take a chunk out and put it into an annex you know, as, as an attachment because you refer to the historical side. So that all became an annex that I kept referring to then in my dissertation. So it's, it's that kind of thing. You know, you need to understand that, OK, if you're working in a civilian job, it might be fairly straightforward. But in uh, defence, in, in the Army, Air Force, Navy, when you've got a turban and a beard to go with it and things like that, there are other requirements, health and safety issues that you could look at and things like that. It's exactly the same in the, um, you know, aerospace industry, you know, aeronautical industry. You know, um, if you've got somebody's a Sikh and his beard's open, you know, and if he's working on aircraft equipment and things like that, is the beard going to be a hazard? Is he going to get caught, caught with moving parts? You know, things like that. So you've got, to, you've got to look at all kinds of other issues and look at how you're going to accommodate. If you want to be fully inclusive, how are you going to accommodate people from the diverse, yes. all the diverse communities? And, and then the most recent re change we've had is Rastafarians can now grow the dreadlocks. Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of the young lads have started growing their hair long and putting them into dreadlocks. And uh, so what we've said to them is, OK, you've got the permission now. You can do that and you can have corn rolls, corn rails, whatever you want, uh, the terminology you want to use uh, to keep your hair tidy. But eventually when your dreadlocks are so sort of long, then you're going to get to a stage where your normal hat will not fit. So how are you going to do it? Are you going to wear a tam? You know, and if you are going to wear a tam, which is the like the uh, a wrap covering, like, yeah. yeah, covering. But 
have a look. So we, you know, because I'm sort of uh, on the dress reg sort of subcommittee, you know, uh, and what we said is empowered them to say, right, as a network, have that discussion amongst yourselves, work out how you're going to do it. And as Sikhs, we wear the blue turban because it's already a uniform code. So if you go for the same color, figure out how you're going to attach a badge and things like that, because again, depending on what rank you are, the badge is different. So you know whether you've got to salute somebody or not, you know, all that kind of stuff comes into it. So, you know, then come up with that and then we'll look at it, put it up to the senior leadership team, get it approved and get it into the dress regulation. So then you've got a, 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 a you've got a guide that you can follow. You know, so we look, we're looking at all that kind of stuff and evolving because I find it that hard that, you know, when a different faith sort of says, right, hang on, why can't I grow my hair long? You know, initially the answer was, no, no, you've got to be short back and sides. But then me as a Sikh, I've been always allowed to wear my turban and grow my hair, you know. So I'm glad that we're catching up and making sure that it's inclusive and equal for everybody. Uh, can I add yeah, to that? To ask? Equality, equality does not mean, and, mm -hmm. and the example you give is a good yeah. one. Equality does not mean treating everybody the same. Mm -hmm. Um, which is which is what confuses quite a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. you know, you don't treat people equally by treating them all the same, and mm -hmm. and um, that has major 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 ramifications actually. So, yeah. so in terms of in, in terms of um, uh, the issue of <clears throat> overrepresentation or underrepresentation, what I would say uh, is 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 this. I think we need to be aware. Uh, uh, Britain and its institutions, uh, most of them still have white managers, right? Mm. Including universities, my sector. We need to be aware that the average black person in this society from a very early age becomes aware of their otherness. They become aware of how racist the culture is and and people people treat them in particular ways uh, including people like police officers for example right mm. now if that's the case if you if you grow up in an environment where you you you're constantly aware that you're in a culture that is hostile or potentially hostile then it it behoves those who run institutions to be aware of that and to ask what is it about our culture that might send out the right or wrong kind of messages to people. I was helping Cambridge University, for example, and indeed Oxford at different times, recruit more and more black students from urban areas into those institutions. Yeah. And the one issue that came up all the time is that there was no question that those young women and those young men who got into Oxbridge had the capacity, hugely talented. But when they got into that encrusted environment, and it is encrusted. Mm -hmm. Monocultural, as one very good friend of mine put it at Cambridge. Yes, indeed. You, you, the, 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 then the, you, the, you, you've got to have totally different navigation tools in order to be able to to navigate that environment. Mm. Because it isn't deliberately hostile, but by virtue of its encrusted nature and all the, 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 the things that go to make up uh, um, um, the culture, much of it is alienating. It's alienating to white working class students. It's alienating to black students, whether they be from Africa or from the, from the um, um, Southeast Asia or the Indian subcontinent. So, and, and, and I had to spend quite a lot of time working with the vice chancellor at Cambridge. I helped to establish a race equality advisory group, for example, and looking at all of those issues to do with culture and expectations and, and I mean, it's, because it's all very quaint, you know, I mean. The, but but the uh, dining, concretely, um, Gus. That, May I ask you, um, but concretely in your example, what, what, what sort of things did you tell this race uh, quality advisory? It's a university. So people go there, they do their studies and they, they come. It's a, where, where is the place for race equality in that? You either do your studies, you do your prep or you don't. So where, where can you describe to me um, where that race equality actually fits? So you talked about decolonizing the curriculum earlier on, right? 
Right. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, I was being interviewed on television for, for by a TV crew for one of these small acts programs that Steve McQueen did in 2020, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, and I was interviewed by a very talented young black woman, a recent graduate from a high profile Russell Group University, okay? And she told me, I, I asked her what she did at university. She told me she did literature, English literature. And I said to her, I, I said to her, do you mean English literature or literature in English? How long was your course? Four years. So was it English literature or literature in English? And, and she, she, she turns around, she looked puzzled and asked me, what is the difference? Because <laughs> yeah, there's a hell of a lot of work out there written in English, but it's not by the British. Exactly. So, 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 so here you have someone highly talented. She got a first from this Russell Group University. I ask her that simple question, and she turns back and asks me, What is the difference? When we drill down into it, in the four years she spent in that place, the only two authors who were not non white and non English part of the English canon that she'd studied was Chimananda Adichie, Half of a Yellow Sun, and um, uh, Chinua Achebe's trilogy, Things Fall Apart, Arrow of God, No Longer at Ease. And I thought to myself, how is that possible? In 2020, 21, 22, how is it possible for a young black woman born in this country to go to a Russell Group University to study English literature and, and having that kind of a conversation with me. So, so okay, so that, that's, that, is, that, is one, that is one example, but there, there, are, there are other things. I'm an engineer. How would that apply to engineering? Because that's all maths and whether things break or not, and aerodynamics. So how would one apply that? I'm not, not to challenge you, but I'm really trying to understand because no, literature no, exactly. I can understand is clear. And, 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 you know, at Coventry University, where I've been working with the vice chancellor and his senior leadership team, we've, got, we, we've had to look at all those kinds of things. The, the whole issue of expectations, right? What expectations do the staff in that place who are predominantly white have of students based upon their background? Some people have high expectations of Chinese students, of Indian students, much lower expectations of Bangladeshi and Pakistani and Caribbean students. Uh, and, and that plays its way through the whole thing. I mean, the universities now are concerned about what they call the attainment gap between black graduates and, 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 uh, and, 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 and white ones. I don't call it the attainment gap, I call it the awarding gap. Because if yeah. these people are there doing the same kind of work as everybody else, the question is, what is it along their journey? If they came in, sometimes with quali qualifications higher than their white counterparts, what is it along their journey that leads to, 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 to that kind of attrition um, at, 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 at the end? And <laughs> that is why I say, if we're going to decolonize the curriculum, in the manner that I was suggesting in relation to the English literature student, we've got to decolonize the institution. Because, because it's these institutional mindsets and arrangements, et cetera, that constrain people in terms of their ability to be their best and do their best. And that carries over into industry. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, we've got a uh, brilliant example recently. I, we did a seminar with uh, Matthew Saeed, and he's written a book called Rebel Ideas. And uh, he sort of discussed, and it actually made good sense, that, you know, if you sort of recruit a certain type of person from a certain institution, as in, you know, the Oxbridges or whatever, yep. then they're all primed to think in a particular way and process in a particular way. So, for example, if you look at defence, the military, we, we send most of our uh, engineering officers to Loughborough, Southampton and Newcastle and some to Aston, but predominantly them three universities. Now, if all those tutors there, professors, et cetera, teaching all, all these normal, normally um, 
white male engineering officers the same way to process and problem solve and things like that. Mm. Sometimes you're going to end up with a problem where you can't really solve it. But if you've got diversity because outside your racial experience that mm, you've been it. promoting, mm. effectively. yeah, that's it. So, mm. but if you're then recruiting from other universities where perhaps the makeup isn't the same, and you know you've got people from different diverse backgrounds as well coming in, then you've got these rebel ideas because because then there's going to be people there who are going to say, "Hang on, but I was taught to process it in a, that in a different mm. way," because we're all yeah. primed, you know, to sort of think in a particular way through education and things like that, how to problem solve in a particular way. I mean, one of the good examples I use is I learned to speak Punjabi first. So I yeah. process in Punjabi and yeah. I often can think of myself, you know, I can see myself thinking in Punjabi, but what comes out of my mouth is English, you know. Uh-huh. And if I'm if I've then got Punjabis in the audience not knowing about it, um or without realizing it, I'll be talking away, having a conversation or whatever, and the odd Punjabi word sneaks in. You know? Yes, yes. And it's always happening right. unconsciously, right. you know. Right. Yeah. So, so if you that, and that made me think of that, you know, and then, and then, and in a way, you know, what he said was right, you know, because this is at a diversity and inclusion uh, event in London, that actually he's right, you know, we need that diversity, and we need to acknowledge that diversity and give them the equal recognition and opportunities, so that, you know, all all the organisations we work more effectively, more efficiently, you know, um, and and you can see that because. You know, like like I said, you know, I've I've just um, you know, had a young Sikh girl join the Air Force a couple of years ago. Uh, she went to Welbeck Military College, then she went to Loughborough University, and now she's an engineering officer at Bryce Norton. And uh, but although she's been through that military sort of chain, I'm hoping that her being a Sikh and a Punjabi girl, you know, she's going to process slightly differently and then start to shine, or maybe you know. Um, show her talents of that different thought process you know it's that kind of thing you know and and we need to acknowledge that we are all different you know and then we've got cultural things as well that creep in the way you process things and that way you handle problems solving and things like that you know and and there's there's so many different things out there that you could actually discuss it's just time yeah, I so, wonder what that means for accreditation, because that's something mm, that because that's definitely a standard, isn't it? So yeah. that we put that on everybody, and you will fit the chartered engineer principles. That's it. I mean, I'll give you an example on that one as well. So on our interview process, if you want to join the military, you get asked various questions. They want to see if you're a team player, do you do any activities? So they asked a young Sikh lady, have you done any adventure training and, st- and stuff like that, or sports? Now, Asian girls don't normally get opportunity to do a lot of sports. It's Your parents quite rare. don't let them do it. You exactly. should be studying at home. That's it. You, <laughs> or you're not allowed out, you know. Yes. So there's all that kind of stuff. So at, on the question, obviously, they sort of didn't award her many points. And then they said, do you do any charity work? So she said, charity? No. But she probably uh, goes to the Gurdwara. Exactly. See, you're thinking differently there which proves my theory, you know, and my Matthew Said's <laughs> theory. So the recruiter, who was white, marked her down for that as well, and then said, have you done any adventure training? And she said, no. So when I rang her up and I said, what do you do every Sunday? She says, I go to the Gurdwara. And I said, do you just go and listen to the prayers and come home? She goes, no, I'm normally in the kitchen preparing the communal meal, then helping wash up and do this and do that. And I put money in the in the collection box. So I said, well, that's charity. She goes, but I don't see that as charity. She sees that's that something service. I do. That's her culture. That's what that's you the do culture, you know. <clears throat> and then, uh, and then, because she was an Indian-born Sikh, and she'd only just come over sort of the past ten odd years, I said to her, "While you're in India, did you go to any of the holy sites, the gurdwaras?" And she said, "Yeah, just a couple of years ago, we went back as a family. We went to a gurdwara called Hemkot Saab, which is up in the halfway up the Himalayas." It's actually mm. a two-day trek up, right? You pay your, do your pilgrimage and two-day trek back, back down again. Well, that's adventure training. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. So sometimes mm. you know, our whole processes are all geared up for the generic purpose. Yeah. And we don't yeah. think outside. So I talk to all the recruiters and say to them, 
you need to start digging in. If they say no, say, well, what about in your culture? Do you do anything? You need to ask those deeper mm. questions. You need to delve in and you need to understand the different community groups to then try and find out have they done the t ticks in the boxes that we're looking mm -hmm. at to, mm -hmm. to, to make sure that they got the team working, the adventurous skills, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I just, think that's it. I'm, I'm just conscious of the time we've hit um, yeah. more or less one hour, but this is this leads perfectly into the point I was really thinking next mm. to ask, which is so in it, as we've discussed about, you know, it's it's not about minority. It's about the global majority of people in mm. terms of us as as non white mm. individuals, mm. communities. Mm. You know, we shouldn't call ourselves my we shouldn't think as a minority. We, we should be saying, no, we're people. And then mm. fine. But it is a factual truth that where I work, certainly I'm on a very small percentage of non-white people in an international organization. And I think going from aircraft to space, I noticed that actually got smaller because of the nature of the industry. Not that it's racist. It's because it's because going towards, let's say, from aircraft, you can have more civilian activities right. lending itself to more people joining with green cards or work permits. But as you go to space, right. it becomes more national defense. And that means you've got to be a passport holder, a citizen and you can't just right, be a right, work right, right, so it just right. means that it's automatically filtering well, that's one clue right there mm. but how do we engage in the industries and the society and the professional and engineering societies like royal air imec whatever um how do we engage with the the white allies that are there that probably most of them are well-meaning people right they want to help maybe they as we said at the beginning they don't, maybe they don't know what to say maybe they don't know what to do but Bali touched on that by saying, well, look, when we have a chartered engineering panel or a recruitment panel for awards or something like that, how do what do we do? Does that mean we start sending representatives such as ourselves to go and talk to those people and say, look, you know, these criteria that you've got, if you just ask whether you worked for a climb Mount Everest or not, that's pretty much yes or no. So mm -hmm. how, make sure you ask culturally aware questions as well, like bring in, are you aware? So training the recruiters, training the, is that something, what, what would you recommend that we do? To well, engage well, 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 certainly that, I mean, you will know, uh, Shumit, that over the years, we've had to do a lot of training in terms of um, equal employment opportunity, interviewing and selection and so forth. Mm -hmm. Because people were asking the most crazy things of individuals or letting the prejudices determine whether they allow someone to go on to the next stage or not and and, and so on. Mm. So we had to we we had to 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 drill down into all of that and give people concrete examples of how when they are on an interview panel and have that power to choose and people are coming to them and telling them stuff. Uh, it, it, it is a very powerful position and the signals that they send out are either encouraging to the applicant or the interviewee or they're demotivating. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's a question of understanding that there are all of these cultural factors engaged, involved in, 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 in all of that business. And the organization, as I was saying earlier, has got to really look at itself and ask certain questions as to whether those sorts of, A, are they necessary, <laughs> number one, mm -hmm. and B, if they're necessary, how can they be framed in such a manner as to allow the person, just, just as Bali was saying, allow them the opportunity to expand and to think outside the box that they think you're presenting to them. Mm -hmm. so, that, so, that, so that they're able to, to tell you as yeah. much as they can about themselves and their abilities and 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 you would you would then be able to determine whether these skills are transferable or not yeah so it it, it it's it's it, it is all of that it is all of that stuff really um and and you know for me especially again thinking of my 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 children's experiences and, and my grandchildren's experiences now, for me, it's a question of how, how can this society normalize itself? Mm. Uh, not, not on the axis of whiteness and, and, and history and, 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 and all of that stuff, but in terms of basic human interactions and treating people as you yourself would like to be treated. How, how, can, how can institutions operate their policies, their practices, yeah. their processes, 
in such a manner that it allows space for black people to breathe, to be themselves, to, to not be choked up with all kinds of expectations that, that, that they're likely to encounter. It, it's, it's, it's fundamental. I mean, I do a lot of work at UCL with head teachers and principals of schools and colleges and so on. And I'm able by virtue of the other things that I do to give them concrete examples of ways in which even when they don't intend it, much of what they do is pretty oppressive really. Yeah, mm. and, and some of them are mortified to think that this is how it, it actually comes over. But when I work with people two or three grades lower down, middle managers in those same institutions or those same multiple academy trusts or whatever, I get a completely different picture of how these people, although they're managers themselves, are experiencing the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other thing, of course, is that race remains the elephant in the room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People don't like to talk about it too much. And they certainly do not like to have their, their conduct and their practices interrogated. Uh, and, and so, which is why I said, you know, we need to, we, we need to open it up so that it is not just a question yeah. of how can we attract these people, et cetera, but what is it about our, what, what is the culture like in here? How, yeah. how inclusive is it? How, how, how flexible is it in terms of accommodating um, um, other, other, other people and other cultures and so on, because not well, as as Carissa would would would, would confirm, knowledge production um, is not the 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 preserve of white Europeans. Um, so I think Bali, would you like to say? Yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the things we're looking at is each uh, RF station. Um, the station commanders are now sort of looking at ways of doing it so my local station which is wittering near peterborough on the a1 you know they're looking at because uh, obviously each station's got a lot of diversity allies they've got uh, people who are uh, from the, the different networks and stuff they've all come together and on the 23rd they're going to start off with a polish day right because we've had a massive contribution from the polish community in the air force especially world war ii you know uh, mm -hmm. if you look at the uh, the Polish squadrons who fought in the Battle of Britain, you know, the first, the top 10 ACs in the Battle of Britain, four of them were on Polish squadrons, three were actually Polish, the number one was Czechoslovakian, and I say it's that kind of thing, and yet, you know, there's, again, this thing, these people from Eastern European, you know, Eastern European countries coming in, making our jobs and all this kind of stuff, you hear some of these comments, you know, but they don't realise that they too fought alongside us for this country and freedom and stuff like that, so, we planned a Polish day where we're going to have the Polish community coming in onto the base, interacting with the, uh, the personnel from the base, talking about the contribution, have a display of uh, their contribution in World War II with the, with the Royal Air Force. And then obviously we know there's Polish personnel, civilians working on the campus, civil servants, civil servants involve them as well. You know, so there's a modern link. And then that's going to be followed in September by a Caribbean day. And I know uh, one of my colleagues, you know, she's a, a corporal uh, at Wittring. She wants to get a steel band there playing as well. And then, again, the cuisine in the canteens or the messes will be from that cultural group as well on that day. You know, so on the Polish day, it will be Polish cuisine. So people can actually try the food as well. So it's more of a cultural awareness day, you know, so making sure that everybody understands the links and stuff the culture, have a chat with people who are actually from that background, and then that's going to be followed. Hopefully, my plan is for in time for Diwali, have a sort of an Indian day, you know, so use Diwali as a platform, but then say, this is why we celebrate Diwali, and here's some of the foods, you know, and this is what we do, and even have a couple of people. Like a cultural outreach, regrets. effectively. That's it, yeah, yeah. Because, because the other thing is, you know, in the military, I don't know, uh, in, the oil, in the actual civilian side of things, but in the military, I've come across people who've come from a village in the middle of nowhere in Northumberland, you know, whatever, and they never come across a person of colour, and then when they see me, you know, they look, they, you can see them, they're looking and the questions, it's a, you yeah. can see the clock cogs ticking. Uh, are you, what, what are you? You know, um, are you from India or something? You know, what's you know they've read about it and they've forgotten it in the background somewhere that was Sikh. Or are you and, black or brown? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's the thing. You know, and then they finally sort of say, well, and they actually sort of quite apologetic. You know, I'm sorry, but you know, I come from 
uh, middle of nowhere. I've never seen a person like you yeah. before, you know, that kind of thing. But I'm quite happy to talk about myself and, you know, the other people, and I use history a lot. So I think we need to be positive as well, and we need to sort of take the, the full thing to educate our colleagues to say, this is what, you know, this is why I am, this is why, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a part of the one of the diverse groups, you know. Yeah, I think just... And, to highlight, Shumit, I think the report that you talked about, the equity effect, talks about, you know, that reluctance to have that, that nervousness to have that conversation mm. in fear of, um, you know, um, ruffling some feathers or um, offending others. But as highlighted here today, it's important to have those open conversations. Mm. So just to address Emma's and, and, and Richard's um, questions in the chat, like what action do we need to take and what advice do we give to leaders? Well, it's to have those open, honest mm. conversations because we're happy to to help raise the awareness and share our experiences with you. So that can be taken into account when you develop tools, policies, frameworks within your organizations. And um, so that it takes into account uh, different experiences from different uh, ethnicities um, and making sure that those tools, frameworks, policies, etc., are fit for purpose. We have we have a voice in that. So start by having those open, honest conversations with us. And is that something I'm going to quickly uh, actually closing up as well to give you a chance that, um, Carissa, is that also something that you might imagine taking forward to the society, the Royal Aero Society itself? Um, is that one, uh, something you could recommend or you might think about recommending uh, going forward well, based that's on the discussion really, today? Well, that's what we started today, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, having that conversation, and I'm sure mm -hmm. it's brought to light. It's been very educational for me as well. <laughs> Even with my background, it's been really enlightening and insightful for me to hear the different different perspectives. And I think this is the starting point. Um, I, I asked you, Shumit, before we set set up the that we started the call, well, what are we going to do with this after, mm -hmm. you know, and it's taking the learnings and making sure that we're applying it in the right places. And that's important, not just for the society, but for organizations across the aerospace, aviation and space sectors. And ensuring that people are comfortable with the language that they're using so that there's no timidity about, you know, dealing with issues and dealing with them head on really um because quite a lot of what happens is people tend to shove things away and push it into a corner or whatever because they think it's too difficult to to to, to, to confront mm -hmm. so the, the the institution loses an opportunity to learn uh, managers lose the opportunity to develop themselves and their awareness and understanding yeah. and quite a number of of managers fail to embrace the responsibility to do that in their own right because it's the right thing to do um in other words you know I, I i speak a lot about managing and leading with moral purpose and that i mean doing things because they are the right things to do rather than what the guidelines say or what the law requires you to do or whatever because that's how we as human beings we interact with one another and it shouldn't be any more. It shouldn't be any different in the workplace, in terms of the way we encounter and give space to people to be themselves, and to see what is hurting them, mm -hmm. so that you know you can have a conversation about what you what you what you experience negatively, without it having to escalate into a complaint, or 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 or, or be be something to be investigated. And it's when people see that there is that kind of openness around that they would have the confidence to tell others that the fears they have about joining you are, are, are not well founded. Mm -hmm. Rather, what happens now is that people go in and after a few years they come out and they have the, you know, not particularly um, rosy things to say about their experience. Some years ago, I was involved over a long period with uh, Professor um, um, Chris Mullard, who, who, who ran an organization called Focus Consultancy. Focus Consultancy got a big contract from the army to help with recruitment. And we were doing a lot of work in, in, in Lancashire particularly, um, and, and, and groups of people were coming there from schools, from colleges and, and, and so on. 
Um, and the questions that they were all asking, especially of the serving officers, as Bali was saying, you, you, you bring out people who are in the army or the air force or whatever, and have been part of the system. The question they were asking them more than anything else is, have you experienced racism? What form has that taken? How did your superiors deal with it, et cetera? Because that's, mm. that's what's on people's minds. Yes. And when you speak to the Black Police Association, uh, um, um, you, get, you, get, you get exactly the same kind of narrative. So mm. it, it's, it's I, I do not, <laughs> I firmly do not believe <laughs> that there's anything intrinsically wrong with people like me, or like or 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 like, or like, or like Bali, it's it's really a question of understanding why there are these cultures, institutional cultures, that do not allow for people to feel that freedom to use all their talents and skills, and you know, there mm. can be a hundred thousand mm -hmm. of 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 Carissas around the place. Um, and 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 it's really a matter of you know what what do you do to make sure that that becomes organic? When I was director of education in in in, in Hackney, St Thomas's and Guy's hospitals, the, the the dean of medicine came to see me, and said we want your help because we're having lots of Chinese um, medical students, lots of Indian medical students. And that is generational in many Indian families. <laughs> um, but but we're having very, very few people from the Caribbean. Now, as it happened, my, my, my first child, my first son, is a medical doctor. And I was able to talk with him, get some understanding of what goes on in the medical school that he attended at Manchester University, and how he would want to, from his own experience, how he would want to present to children in year nine, year 10, year 11, and so forth. So we devised a scheme and it was very successful. Graduates from the medical schools would come into the Hackney schools and they would have the students go with them for a weekend to, to whatever, whatever it is, sometimes Oxford, sometimes York, sometimes Cambridge. And there, they, they got a very clear understanding of what it meant to be a medical student, how it is that, that um, they, as, as Caribbean students, could do more in terms of gaining an awareness of, 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 of medicine and, and, and building their aspirations and so on. And these kinds of initiatives, I think, are absolutely crucial. But they, they 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 cannot and should not be tokenistic. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but I'm, okay, I'm aware that the Royal Arrow Society does engage directly with uh, schools and people, and we we do try and reach out as much as possible. But I think that's also something we can look at it more. Uh, we do at a university level as well, which is how I ended up joining the society about twenty plus years ago. That because somebody came to my university course to talk about. Oh my God, there was a there was a. a a white person but still they came about joining industry and talking about but maybe sure. we also need to put more uh people from uh, sort of the um black black asian um communities for example to go out and actually uh, deliver that message as well so we can certainly look at that sort of thing oh how can um, we do more um work placements or work experience how can we have our partners or corporate partners welcome more um, work experience students yes, yes. Before open the go. doors for them. Before yeah, I mean, that's, that, that, that's hard for us purely because in the military, you know, we can't sort of just walk anybody onto a base and stuff because, of, you know, security yeah. clearance and stuff like that. But what we do do is, you know, if we've got people who are really interested, we'll arrange a day visit for them and escort, show them around and stuff like that. So that's sort of quite key. Um, and also, you know, having the reflective role models out there to actually go and talk to them. So if I get somebody who's sort of, uh, um, say, from uh, whatever, background you know they could be religious or their actual ethnicity um if they want to join and they've still got those some couple of questions or something like that they're not quite sure then i've got a list of uh, about 100 volunteers who are all ambassadors from different backgrounds and mm -hmm. what i do is say right i know somebody you can talk to and i actually mm -hmm. get the, the RAF person to ring them up to have that chat 
you know, that kind of thing, because mm. they need to be comfortable and then they need to be able to sort of relate to somebody from their own background, etc. And, you know, Visible ask those awkward person. questions. Yeah. Mm. You know, and answer them. So, I mean, I've had um, a Sikh, Sikh, you know, young man who wanted to join and uh, his parents turned around and said, no, no, you're not joining. You're not going off to war, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, so I had a chat with his parents and uh, I, I was doing a live show on Akal TV, which is one of the Sikh TV channels, a live chat show. And I actually said to him, right, ring in, you know, watch the show and ring in with those questions. Uh, and then uh, he recently graduated about uh, two months ago. Um, mm. And I went to his graduation and his mum came, came over and said, brilliant, you know, I, I, I don't know why, why I was worried because he's actually an engineering officer now in the Air Force or he's waiting for his phase two training, you know, but he's going to be an engineering officer. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's that kind of thing. And I think also the other thing is in the military, we have a hierarchy system, a rank system. And I found that, you know, when I was younger, you were always cautious. You know, do I say something? Do I want to stir it? You know, will that really have repercussions? Mm -hmm. But now that I'm a rank of a one officer, you know, I have the power, <laughs> so I'm not afraid. You know, a bit like Kay, you know, you said, you know, you, you know, Absolutely. submit, you know. No, I that's exactly now... a very interesting point. Is that it's yeah. Uh, there is I also can tackle a rank those system. issues on behalf of other people. Exactly, and and that's that's what my late father did as well as a medical yeah. doctor. He came in the 70s and and uh, faced just open racism in the health service, mm. and it was clear. But he and a few other doctors made their way up mm. the top. And in later years, we we my sister and I my, uh, encountered other kind of middle mm. uh, uh, rank doctors that were of Asian. A descent, let's say, and they said, you know what, your dad inspired me to get, because he was one of the first that mm. was flying the flag and fighting those fights to get more Asians recognized yeah. and going through. And he, you know, he passed away earlier this year, but I'd like to think also try and carry on as I've gone through the engineering, even though we don't mm. have ranks, but we have grades. We have manager and worker and all these different hierarchies. We have fellow and member and in the societies and all sorts of things. And there are there are grades and one does feel that, oh, should I be talking to that person? They're the president elect of the Royal Aero Society. And and the, you, you feel that, OK, there's a barrier, but how, you know, one way is to try and engage, but also mm. when one is in those positions, yeah. you know, one has the power to actually mm. start those conversations because you're yeah, of rank. Yeah. And, and, I, I think, and I think I think the other problem is that a lot, a lot of the time organizations will hide behind the policy. Mm. Or we've got this policy and they'll try and hide behind it. But uh, but. I'm, I've been fortunate again because I've, I'm, I've been a one officer for a few years now. I've, one of my previous chief of the air staffs actually said, "Well, if you're not happy with it, it's only a policy; it's a guideline. Address it, get it changed." So I've always taken that as a little hint, you know, and it's perhaps a message to everybody, you know, a policy is a guideline. So and they need to be reviewed. Yeah, that's it. So recently, I had a case in relation yeah. to their application and and mm -hmm. the impact that they're having. Yeah. So recently I had a young lady who wanted to join the Air Force and she was going through the process and she was getting ready to go to phase one military training at uh, Holton near Aylesbury. And she was from, uh, I think she was Nigerian, but she had a very a sort of Afro type hairstyle. Now, I understand being somebody who's got long hair, you know, and a beard and stuff that, yes, you know, you have everybody's got different type of hair. You know, some have got frizzy hair, some have got you know, uh, hair that's sort of very uh, curly, etc. So she asked the question, can I do cornrows or cornrails so that it's yeah. easy for me every day? I don't have to spend half an hour trying to flatten my hair, you know, mm -hmm. while I'm in training because then I've got to then put my headdress on. So I said, good question, actually. Never thought of that. I'll ask the question for from mm -hmm. the, the guys who run phase one training. And their simple answer was, no, she's going to have to trim it down because it's got to be off the collar. And if it's not off the collar and she's going to get a headdress, you know, blah, 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 uh, she'll be in trouble. So I wasn't happy with the answer. And I said, you know, sometimes my rank here has the virtue. So I, I got in touch with uh, our DNI team and the dress regulations policy team. And I said, I'm not happy with this. What do you think? And they said, well, actually, the rule just says the hair has got to be off the coil collar. It doesn't say how it's going to be off the collar. So norm, normally a normal white person in the Air Force, which is what the rules are based under, you know, it said put it in a bun at the back of the head. Mm. So we looked at it 
had a discussion said okay so i said to the dni dni team you know can you go back to the school and say to them well actually your interpretation is wrong as long as it's off the collar it doesn't state that you can't have corn rolls corn rails etc you know so we had that change straight away and then since then with the dress regs committee all three services have said yes you can now have corn rolls corn rails etc so you can grow your hair as long as it's tied up you know you can do it and then when you're in relaxed dress why can't you have a ponytail or a plait yeah. you know so all three services have adopted that as well and we need to look at these rules and policies and stuff and evolve because that's making people demonstrate their difference if you want to call it that yeah. because it's a visible are statement yeah to that's it. identity yeah. Mm. Yeah. i'm going to bring in one question from the the chat there um what action do you think needs to be taken to encourage more understanding and action taking of equity rather than equality and that's within any organization or group what's the one is there one thing that one could say <clears throat> equity mm. versus equality well, I suppose it, it goes back to what I was saying earlier on when, when I interjected while Carissa was speaking, which is that you don't treat people equally by treating them all the same. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. We all have different needs, different capacities, um, and uh, it is the, the, the responsibility of the organization to ensure that our needs are not made barriers to our advancement, which is why the Equality Act 2010 states that uh, organizations must make reasonable adjustments if someone has dyspraxia or dyslexia, for example, or is sight impaired or whatever, um, and, and, and you, you, you're, you're, you're um, employing them as they have a right to be employed, then you make the adjustments that would enable them to use their skills and capacities to the full. Um, and, and there are some organizations that resist what they consider to be what they call special treatment. Yeah, because they, because they, 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 they have this view that equality means that you treat people the same. So if you do something different for this individual, then it suggests you're giving them special treatment. We we have to we have to understand that circumstances uh, uh, um, demand from time to time that we take action to to uh, uh, remove uh, underrepresentation. And affirmative action is is totally allowed within the legislation. You can't do positive discrimination, but you can certainly take affirmative action. So if it means that you are underrepresented in that particular area of the of the organization or of the business, and and um, uh, you need to do particular things that would actually enable a group, whether it be flexible working for women or uh, whatever else it may be, actions that would actually facilitate and allow people to enjoy the same rights as everybody else. Affirmative action. It doesn't mean then that people should be jumping up and down and say, well, you know, why, why, why do you have um, a black women's group and, 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 or a black staff group and not a, a, um, a white staff group? Um, it, it, it becomes as nonsensical as that in a number of situations. But managers must have the knowledge and understanding to be able to deal with those sorts of uh, comments or queries or protestations and and justify the actions that the organization is taking and i think okay. this is why we can't have that umbrella this is why there's pushback about that umbrella term because it doesn't help yeah. us identify and address and develop the right tools and to take the right actions to achieve equity. Yes, absolutely. Because it's almost absolutely. like what we're saying is uh, organizations need to do a stock take of their demographic and then understand what each group within that demographic needs 
in yes. order to be legitimately uh, successful in the, the job at hand, yes. Yes. Or whatever they're yes. trying to do. And then mm. you check as well, this group might need these things, that group only needs that little bit there. That group yes. is a whole bunch of stuff. And then the equity will come from allowing those needs to be met, albeit different amounts of needs for each group. But the a end result is that everybody is contributing to their given job in the best possible way they can. Yeah. Uh, I understood yeah. it correctly. And, and almost as uh, Gus alluded, you know, it's not about being then treated treated fairly because, or sorry, equally, mm. because we're not all equal. Mm. You know, we we got different requirements, different needs, but treated fairly, so that we all have an equal opportunity. I think that would be a better statement, wouldn't it? Mm. Everybody fairly. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can bring the discussion to a, to a close now. We've gone over a little bit, but I think the discussion was very nice, very pleasant, very en enlightening, certainly for me watching it as well. Um, I'm taking several points away, which I think the thing is being recorded, so it's uh, available for people to diverse over. But I'm, I'm understanding that people, terminology that narrows and and umbrellas people and groups together is less helpful going forward and we do have terms like BAME that exist however this is just not helpful going forward we need to be trying to look at the diversity of people uh, more and, and looking at each group's needs more if we have to have a truly fair uh, society and the society in, in this case we're talking about it, not just the global society we're also talking about the Royal Aero Society and I think we have uh, things to refer to here. Um, we want positive role models in the industry to say that if you, you can't be what you can't see, which is a quote friends of mine do say, and uh, I think uh, somebody in one of the astronauts said this as well, maybe Sally Wright or someone, but it was, you can't be what you can't see. We need to see positive role models that people from different diversity, different groups can say, well, look, they're doing it. Maybe I can have a chance and then they, they can look and apply. Um, we need to facilitate within organizations and ask organizations to look at what the needs are, but also facilitate the decision making and the decision making to enable those needs to happen. We talked about the turban wearing and things. Sometimes people look at the policy and say, well, the rule and say, that's the rule. Thank you. Treat everyone the same. There's the rule. But there might be a way of saying, well, we're going to respect your rule, but whilst account accommodating the actual need. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a black and white answer, but encouraging the management and the leadership to accept that that change and what you say special treatment is not special treatment, it's enabling needs, fundamental mm -hmm. needs of people rather than treating people specially. No, it's acknowledging different groups, fundamental needs to do their job to the correct way. Um, looking at uh, fundamental policies and and people doing the selection and interviewing techniques and interview selections or recruitment people need to also look very carefully at their biases and prejudice that may be bringing into that process. So it's not even up to the applicant. Sometimes it's the person doing the selection is bringing their own decisions, let's say, or biases to that table and making selections based. And we need to be able to educate the interviewers and the selectors that they could be asking different questions. They could be looking at their own situation or other people's situation more carefully and giving more people a chance to fulfill the criteria in their way. And yeah. a couple of wonderful statements is we need to, organizations need to ask the hard questions themselves. And they don't need, need to be afraid not to ask, to, to ask those hard questions. Don't be afraid to ask the hard questions. Challenge the status quo to encourage growth. It's not just about breaking what's been there for 150 years. If you want to move forward for another 150 years, you're going to have to do something difficult now in order to move forward. I believe that the Royal Aero Society is certainly doing that. I believe engineering as an institution and generally certainly the UK is doing that or trying to, but we need to be able to help them. And a wonderful phrase I'm going to take away, policies are guidelines and they need to be reviewed for their application, usefulness and the impact that those policies are having on the organisation and the well-being of that organisation. Just because it's been there for hundreds of years doesn't mean it's good anymore. Mm. So I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's a wonderful phrase. It's a bit like the pirate's code, the guideline. So it's... <laughs> so it's code. Yes, <laughs> from, the, from the Pirates of yeah. the Caribbean films, it's the guideline. So I think it's something to keep in mind. And the more senior that people like ourselves get, the more opportunity we have to, to whether we're from minor, black, white, minority, whatever, 
it's we have the opportunity to make those challenges because when you're a junior in the chain you just want to follow the rules when you're in that senior position mm. authority you have the ability to ask those questions so please ask those questions and then that's ask the right question to take the right action yes yeah and uh, in as much i am strongly recommending shumit that you drop beam um uh, you might want to substitute it's not it's not everybody's kettle of fish but it is less offensive you you might want to substitute the global majority or global majority people and then say exactly who it is that you're talking about people from the african continent people from uh, china people from caribbean whatever mm. understanding though that even within these particular groupings, there's a huge amount of diversity. Mm -hmm. On all, all, yes, all, so all there are subgroups and other yes, religious indeed, groups. Indeed. There's many, many, many. Uh, yes. uh, you know, religious diversity, class diversity, uh, abilities, um, um, disabilities, whatever. Uh, and and and, uh, but 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 the one thing we really must do is to excise from the lexicon any any notion of minority we have to get rid of the minoritizing language really yeah. thank you um carissa as the incoming future um president of the society worldwide please uh, would you have any final thoughts for us you can um, say no as well. <laughs> no, 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 not. Um, this was a really, really good discussion. Um, thank you to the the panelists um, for Balvi and for Professor Gas. I think so. Are we still fight? Unfortunately, in 2022, are we still fighting uh, discrimination? Are we still fighting for equity? Yes. Do we need a strong voice, a strong collective voice to do that? Yes. Do we need to look deeper into the complexities concerning different? ethnicities yes 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 <laughs> and we will yeah. do and i think that's mm, definitely agree with you there you know and and and, uh, and i think you know for people like us you know who are in sort of work, who worked hard and got to where we are we have a duty to our communities you know and the rest of the different diverse groups to be the role models to sort of encourage them to look at STEM subjects, you know, and go into engineering. I mean, this morning I was at a school talking about engineering apprenticeships, you know, uh, and things like that, and and making the kids understand. And I use a simple example, like, you know, if you don't do science, you know, who's going to invent the next generation of things, you know, toys like this, you know? Because I remember the days when we didn't have computers, you know, and things like that. So we, you know, we need, we have that duty to encourage the next generations and stuff like that and they've got the talent that's it they have yeah yeah, yeah. and i think also highlighting that there's value in the different experiences mm. and backgrounds that they come yeah. from mm. sure okay and thank you very much oh please i've got i've got I'm one sorry. bit of good news because uh, um rubina who i know is in the audience um yeah. just to let you all know that just a few days ago i've got made a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. So a bit right. of good news to finish on as well. You know, <laughs> really good. Um, and Rubina's young young lad, uh, Zane, is uh, an air cadet and he's hoping to be a future radiator in the uh, in our, in our uh, fraternity. Yes. Well, send him to the Royal Aero Society. And yes. he well, well, he doesn't know what he wants to do exactly. Yeah, he's hoping to join the Air Force, but if he doesn't, he definitely wants to be in. in Who cares? Send him somewhere. to the Royal Aero Society. We <laughs> no problem. All we represent all professions. All. Yeah. Yes. I, mean, I, I know he would have loved to have been on tonight, but uh, I think he had exams or he had something else already committed. And Serena's on air, so she's going to probably feed back. He's oh, he's a member already. He's there you already go. Yeah, well done, exactly. <laughs> but you can tell it, 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 but there's that sort of generation we need to also feed back to us and tell us what we could be doing better. I have never exactly. come across such an enthusiastic young man who talks about equality and, you know, aviation, flying, etc. He's awesome. Fantastic. Wonderful. It's just the member that we uh, we encourage, just the type of member we encourage. <laughs> 
And I think, um, uh, by the way, we have a similar event on the 15th of June. So another webinar coming up, again, organized by the Diversity Inclusion uh, Committee. And we'll be talking about how to address um, improving the in intake of uh, black and Asian and uh, other global majority people, I'm going to change and say um, into industries and HR processes. So it will be a similar discussion yeah. like this, but focused on that sort of recruitment process. What are the barriers perhaps? What can we do better? And what are good practices uh, available to at the moment? So that's on the 15th of June, again, in a webinar format. Um, and I think Thank you very much. And uh, unless uh, anyone from the organizing team, Akilia, anybody has the uh, any final words, um, I think I will thank everybody. I'll thank Gus. I'll thank Bali. Uh, and thank Chris. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Likewise. Thank you. Good. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I think we can close the event now.